Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me this week is Abe Froman, the Sausage King of Chicago. No, it's not. It's the captain. Well, they called me the Sausage King in high school, so it's good to be seen and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week we are drinking All Struck Dry Apple Oak Cider from All Struck Ciders. Experience the beauty and complexity of fermentation with this sessionable cider. It's smooth, baby. Garage grade three and three quarter bottle caps out of five. And today we opened the fridge and we didn't have to break down and cry because of these good buddies right here. First up, a big, big thanks to Yu Chin from CC Central New York. And a big cheers to Josephine in Brisbane, Australia. Next up, a cheers and many, many thanks goes out to Diane R. in San Francisco. And a big nice jib to Lisa Liu in Camarillo, California. And Captain, here's a long distance cheers and a big high fiver to Rune in Christensen, Norway. And a cheers to Mary in Nova Scotia, Canada. Thanks to everybody from all over the globe for going to truecrimegarage.com and contributing to this week's beer fund. And while you're at the website, check out our store. We have some new t-shirts for sale. I think you're going to dig them. Also, for all of our old episodes, check us out on the Stitcher app. They're exclusively on the Stitcher app. And check out our weekly show, Off the Record. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. On the morning of June 30th, 2011, police located the body of Lauren Giddings. They located her her torso. Now, we talked about the events that took place that morning. We talked about the initial stages of the investigation. It was once a missing persons case, and then, unfortunately, they found her torso. Yeah, I believe they were able to do a DNA test with her mom to determine that the body was actually Lauren's. At 2.15 p.m., a handler and two cadaver dogs arrived on the scene and started their search of the area. Now, forgive me, Captain, for being graphic, but all they have found so far is a torso, and they are looking for the remaining parts and also looking to see where some of the remains may have been concealed, moved, and so on. Right, and like I said, uh, we know that half the trash was actually picked up, so they started thinking that maybe if her her torso was found in one uh, trash bin, that maybe other parts would be found in different bins. Two dogs, the two dogs, this is Cinco and Chance, they hit on eight locations, and these locations are as follows. They hit twice at Lauren's apartment. This was just outside of the front door and in her bathroom. They hit twice in the vacant apartment, which was located immediately below Lauren's apartment, alerting in the living room and in the bathroom. The dogs alerted at Stephen McDaniel's front door, and in his bedroom. They alerted at the apartment complex's laundry room in two places, once at the front door and then again inside this laundry room as well. So they walked these dogs all over the property for the apartment complex. They only hit in eight locations. And of importance, obviously they hit in her apartment, but they hit in Stephen's apartment, They hit in the apartment below her, which was vacant. Nobody was living in there. Mm -hmm. And then they hit in the apartment complex laundry room. Now, police, because of this, they want to seriously interview Stephen McDaniel. He is now coming to into the spotlight, let's say, and emerging as a interesting suspect Mm -hmm. at this time. If anybody wants to, You can go to YouTube and there is a, what is it, Captain, about a two-hour long video 
Yeah. We're, it's, it's very grainy, and the audio quality is very poor. Yeah, we thought about playing some of it here, but the audio is not great. Uh, you know, it, it's it's an interesting video to watch because it is Stephen McDaniel being interviewed or interrogated, question, whatever you want to call it, by detectives at yeah. the Detective Bureau. One of the first things that is said by the detective is, Stephen, put your hands on the table. So let's just call <laughs> it an interrogation. Well, and you know what? And I, I love... Um, I love the South. I love how people talk in the South. And he says, uh, I don't know the detective's name, so forgive me. He says, now put your hands on the table for me, son. (laughs) And he calls him son a few times. And he says, uh, now look at me when I'm talking to you, boy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I like to use the the boy term. And where I might sound aggressive there, he doesn't come off to me as being aggressive. He comes off as being authoritative, but he also... Kind of like he's trying to be Steven's friend mm-hmm. at times. He even says to him at one point, we are friends. Right. You and Lauren are friends. We need to know what happened to your friend. I'm asking you for help. Can you help me? Right. And this whole time you heard Steven talk in those interviews. He's not talking like that when he's at the detective bureau, when he's being questioned. No, he, no it, ask me a question. I'll answer it like him. Okay. Uh, when was the last time you saw Lauren? I don't. No. Have you ever seen Lauren wearing this dress? I'm showing you a picture of her in a dress. No. Does Lauren have a boyfriend? Yes. Did you think you were Lauren's boyfriend? No. What are you doing with guns in your apartment, Stephen? I don't know. Why do you have them? I don't know. Yeah, his his answer was to have them because I, they yeah, kept... I don't. Yeah, they kept asking him. They're like, "Have you ever fired a gun?" And he's like, "No, I've never never fired a gun." They're like, "Well, then why why do you have three firearms?" Yeah. And he doesn't say like protection or anything like that that like he's kind of talking about in his on-camera interview with the local news. He just simply says to have them. Yeah, if you have a sword and you said to me, "Did you, have you ever used a sword?" "No, I haven't." "Why do you have it?" "To have it." That makes sense. Yeah, uh, why do you have a gun uh, to have it? Have you ever shot a gun? No, but I decided to buy three of them. He did say at one time he was a collector of swords. Yeah. Um. So that so for the samurai sword, which it's it's a it's like a cheap knockoff. It's not one of these five, six hundred, seven hundred dollar jobs. But right, right. But that's why I don't <clears throat> find it that odd. It's no because it's people a, collect swords. People collect swords. Yeah, and and people collect guns as well but that's not the answer he provides regarding the guns right but most people that collect guns actually shoot those guns <laughs> yeah, yes they do use those guns <laughs> they, u- they usually shoot them um the important thing here in, in throughout the course of these he's doing multiple interviews multiple questioning periods with the police and detectives throughout the day and well into the night the, the what we were just referencing, I believe, takes place at about 11 p.m. or just before midnight. Yeah. And as said, the video that you can find online is two hours long. I don't know if that's the entirety of the actual questioning. I, I think there was probably more out there. But right. And I just want to point out again, here's here's an individual, Stephen, where he's cooperative with the police initially, then hesitant to let them in his apartment. And then obviously, I, I'm guessing that they obviously, once they found the body, that they got um, the rights to search apartments. And that's that's when they brought in the cadaver dogs. But now you're down at the station and you're a law student. And they're asking you these questions where you should assume you're a suspect and he's not asking for a lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. To, to be clear regarding the the cadaver dogs. I don't think that that's technically the handler's term for these dogs, but that's what the state documents would refer to these dogs as, as cadaver dogs. Okay. And 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 in the documents, they say for a lack of a better term, that's what they were going to call them to just keep it simple. And that's what I refer to them as here. With the cadaver dogs and regarding these earlier searches, these are all permission was granted by the residents in each situation. So they weren't, they, they haven't, you know, got the, the, the legal channels involved yet for, uh, 
search warrants and to just really scour the area. Well, these are like, but like you said, it goes along with now he's at the detective bureau, Stephen McDaniel, 26 years old, and he's not asking for an attorney. Mm -hmm. He was very helpful and very vocal to the local news when he did the interview. But now when he's at the detective bureau, he, there's a transformation there and it's, it's physical and it's audible. It's, it, you can, it, he looks like a damn zombie by the time that he's being questioned at the detective bureau. And he sounds like, or is trying to sound like a scared little boy. Yeah. I mean, I think this is him acting again or, or pretending again. Yeah. At some point during this interview, the detective notices a red mark on Steven's face. This is near his nose. And he asks Steven if he has any other marks on him. And Steven shows him that he has two scratches on his abdomen. That is troublesome for Steven. And it's interesting to detectives because now we have this guy who looks like he might have been in some kind of physical altercation. Yeah. And this is a guy that's pretty much, for the most part, holed up in his apartment, staying in there. According to him, he's studying, and he hasn't seen Lauren in, uh, I believe he says in this interview, one to two weeks. Okay. This is where things get very weird. Mm -hmm. um, f go down the weird road with me, the weird path. Always. So Holding hands. Police found in his apartment in Steven's apartment. They he found they found four condoms. Mm. Now, that doesn't seem like that big of a deal. However, he has told the detectives through the course of his interviews that he is a virgin and that he is happy to be a virgin. He's saving himself for marriage. Yeah, but you, you again, you could explain that away. You're on campus, they're passing them out for safe sex and you grab a couple and no big deal. But he doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. He, when, so they push him. They push him and push him and push him. And they, they want to know if you are saving yourself, if you have no intention to have sexual intercourse, why do you need condoms? Mm -hmm. Why do you have them in your possession? Eventually, he explains that the condoms he stole from people. So two of the condoms he mm -hmm. stole from his sister. And I don't know when that went down, but the other two, we have a better idea because he tells the police that he stole condoms from two of the apartments in his apartment complex. Mm -hmm. So Steven admits to the officer that he entered two different apartments. One apartment he entered in December on December 26th of 2008 and the other one on January 31st, 2009 and each time he stole a condom from each of the uh, apartments. Now, is he saying he's he broke into them or he just entered them? I'm a little unclear on that. Um, the the, but either, either the way. wording in the report says that he entered. Mm -hmm. Now they're going to consider this as a as a breaking and entering. I must. They find a master key in his apartment eventually they've not they've not located that yet right but this master key will allow him into a lot of different places throughout that apartment complex creep and so when they say entered i'm guessing that he has either told them that he has this key or they've figured out that he didn't break into the place he just unlocked the door and went in right and the thing here is captain by this point even before they get this weird information about the condoms, they believe Steven knows more than what he's telling them. They believe he may have killed Lauren Giddings. Yeah. He's their number one suspect. Once he explains to them that he took condoms from other apartments, they go, okay, cool. Thank you for telling us that we are going to arrest you for burglary. We're going to arrest you for burglary. And now we have a reason, a legal reason that we can hold you we need to try to build this murder case against you because right. all we have right now is circumstantial evidence and our suspicions. Now, when he is arrested, when Steven is arrested for the burglary, and your, wait and hold on and go ahead and your creepy stare and your creepy demeanor and, 
and all the weirdness about you or, you know, this adds to it. Right. Stephen McDaniel's maternal grandfather, this is Hollis Browning, who he was very close with Stephen. He hired an attorney for his grandson to represent him regarding these burglary charges. Browning was in his 80s at the time. He was very close to Stephen, as I said. This attorney that he hired is Floyd Buford, who practices both criminal and civil law. From my understanding, Buford is a well-known, well-respected attorney in these parts. Yeah. So this is not a public defender or this is not someone who does not know what they are doing. This is considered a high-level, high-priced, good attorney. Hollis Browning had a lot of hopes for his grandson, a lot of high hopes for the boy that he doted on. Well, heck, he was in law school. Yes, he was hoping that the young man would land a legal job, yeah. get married someday. He, in fact, was planning to pay. He'd be able to use those condoms. You're right. He was, in fact, planning to pay his grandson's first month's rent once Stephen passed the bar exam and found a new place to live. Right. Now, you had mentioned search warrants. Um, it was after all of this this questioning that goes down that they did, in fact, get the proper warrants. So it was on July 1st. It's They're questioning him late into the night after midnight from June 30th. Mm-hmm. Now we're into July 1st at 1.50, at 1.50 a.m. in the morning. Police obtained signed warrants from... Judge Enos for yeah, it, not to be mistaken with Judge Penis. Well, it might be Ennis. I, I I'm having trouble yeah. reading my own writing. Mm. Um, the warrants that they got that they received from the judge were for Stephen's apartment, for his car, for his body, for his DNA, for his hair, for his fingerprints, for his fingernails, and for full body photographs. So, what do they find during these searches? Okay, so let's get the photographs out of the way. That is simply to document these potential injuries, the scratch marks that they had already observed. Right. Okay, regarding what they find in his apartment, we already talked about the one master key. They find two keys that are of concern. One is a master key to the apartment complex. The second one is a key to Lauren Giddings' apartment. Oh, great. They find a shirt that remember we said the torso was found with pink jogging shorts on. Mm -hmm. I want to be very clear. The torso is wearing these shorts. The that's the only thing, only clothing on the torso. There's nothing under the shorts, the shirt that they found. They can't 100% state this in, in 100, you know, it's not a confirmed fact, but it matches the jogging shorts. Right. So it's believed that it's it's the pair. It's it's one of the pair right. to this jogging shorts. Very suspicious thing to find in his apartment. Yeah. In Lauren's apartment, they determine that on some of the walls there somebody had applied fresh paint to some of the walls. And it's believed that whoever did this was painting over blood or other types of evidence. Yeah. The police discovered a large bloody sheet in a washing machine at the apartment complex's laundry room. They found a hacksaw with human flesh on it. It was found in a locked storage closet in the laundry room. Now this apartment complex, like many of them have a laundry room, a laundry facility. To be clear, everybody that lives there has access to this room. Right. What everyone does not have access to is this locked storage closet. The master key found in Stephen's apartment will open that closet. But the master key that he has would be the same as you would expect to find on the landlord's keychain or the maintenance man's keychain. So... Mm -hmm. a few people do have access to this storage closet. Right. It's a limited view, and we can prove that Stephen Giddings or Stephen uh, McDaniel, right. apologize, 
has access to that closet because of the key. They also found a large cooler near the front door of Steven's apartment. They don't go into detail with this cooler. I'm guessing they may suspect that remains may have been in this cooler at one point. Mm -hmm. They found a foam cup with the name Lauren written on it inside his apartment. Now, Stephen owned a Geo Prism. That's like a small vehicle, small car. The police found what they believe to be blood stains on the front and rear seats of this car. Now, on the torso itself, when the torso was located inside the trash bag, inside that trash can on the apartment complex's property, they found some hairs on the torso. Some of them would have been consistent with Laura, Lauren Giddings hair. Mm -hmm. She had long blonde hair. Some of these hairs were consistent with Stephen McDaniel's hair. He has, as we described, like brown kind of a white boy Afro thing going on. Mm -hmm. He's got longer hair. Um, they also found hairs similar to this inside his apartment as well. We've never received confirmation that I could find that those were, in fact, his hairs. Right, but they do get confirmation that they find uh, hairs, Lauren's hairs, on the hacksaw. Well, they determined through DNA testing that, that her DNA was on that hacksaw. Right. And But where did they find her hairs? It her hair was found believed to be in the trash bag with the torso. Okay. Um, again, there's never been confirmation on where those hairs, who they came from, but that's what it states in their reports that they believe them to some of them to be Lawrence and some of them to be Stevens. We just pointed out her DNA is found on that hacksaw that was found locked in a storage closet in the laundry room that Steven had access to that he has access to. And then even more damning, they find the packaging for this saw ah, in his apartment. So him. it appears that he purchased this saw, took it out of the package, used it for something. And we know that her DNA ends up on it. He locks it up in this storage closet and yet he forgot to throw away the packaging for the saw, which is later found in his apartment. So regarding all this information and, and everything that they're working on and working towards in the case that they're building against Stephen McDaniel, he's arrested, as we said, for those burglary charges, but it wouldn't be until 33 days later that prosecutors tacked on a murder charge. He was accused of um, murdering Lauren Giddings. Now, because of this murder charge, they're, they, they're still building this case against him because they don't have a slam dunk case against Stephen McDaniel. Well, it's never a slam dunk. Right. But what further investigation would determine, they are pouring through his computer. Now, mind you, this man spent a lot of time on his computer, and he had a lot of flash drives. He had a lot of... Uh, flicky, flicky drives. He had a lot of tech, mm -hmm. uh, let's say. He's accused of uh, of having a computer flash drive with child pornography on it oh. because they say that they found 54 images of child pornography. Dude's a, a scumbag. And then on top of that, Captain, they said that they found a pair of Lauren Giddings panties in a drawer in his bedroom. Mm. Now, the very strange thing here. I mean, we're already in a weird space. Yeah. He, and I take great pause before I say it. Apparently somebody took these panties and, and made them into a mask. Okay. That's, that's strange. how yeah. I, I've not seen pictures Mm -hmm. But that's how the detective describes it when he's asking Steven about these panties. Yeah, I mean, I wear my underwear on my head every now and then when I get really drunk, but that's just to be funny. So, But I don't make mask out of underwear. Yeah, and they determined that these came from Lauren. They were right. Lauren's, and 
as said, the only clothing found on the torso was just a pair of, of shorts. Right. So they're, they're, th- their thinking is that after whatever happened that he kept these as a souvenir and then he turned these into a mask. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then I, I've also thought maybe if he did have access to her apartment, maybe these, yeah, maybe he stole them prior to June of 2011. Well, like we said, there was that email where she was saying that she thought maybe somebody broke into her apartment, but would later find out that, you know, she, she mentioned to people multiple times that, you know, she would come home and she felt like maybe somebody had been there or, or something had been moved yeah. or that something was missing, but she just thought, well, maybe I, I misplaced it, but it was happening enough where she thought somebody was entering her apartment and messing with things. That's very golden state killer ish. You know, the golden state yeah. killer is reported to have entered people's homes when they weren't there and moved things yeah. to later help him perpetrate the crimes later that night or the next day. Yeah. Which is different than somebody th- this to me, you know, we know Steven has access to our apartment. So how many times was he going in there and taking things? Uh, it seems like his, how level, often was he going into everybody else's apartments? Too? Right. With we know at key. least two times that he's admitted to police. Yeah. And a lot of this stuff to me, captain is because a lot of people have said, look, this dude was, he had finished law school you can hear him talk. He's an intelligent individual, but people question why would he have all these weird things in all this evidence that they would later collect if he in fact did kill her. These are people that say, well, maybe he didn't do it. And maybe some of this evidence was planted. This I really a lot of evidence to plant. Well, and on top of that, I really think that if I think it was just stuff he had not got around to yet. I think they were things that he would have discarded. Keep in mind, he would have been moving out at some point. Right. I think it was just things he had not got around to yet. And when pushed, when he was pushed by police, by detectives, who he he may have thought at one point that he was smarter than them. We know that he interned at the prosecutor's office at one point. So maybe he felt that he could outsmart police if he had to. But... To me, it's when he's pushed, when he's pushed back in a corner, it's almost like, well, I better give them access to something. If I don't, I'll look guilty. We'd all love to hire an interior designer for our homes, just like we'd all love a personal trainer, a masseuse, or a personal assistant. Modsy makes the first one possible, and the other three still require a lottery win. Sorry. Modsy.com is the revolutionary online interior home design service that starts at just $69. That's a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the cost of hiring an interior designer, and so much easier. What you're going to do is you just take a few photos of your space. You're going to take the measurements of your space, furniture and all. You don't have to move anything. Take their style quiz. They're going to tell you what you are into. And then the Modsy designers create two custom design plans for you. And just as the captain said, we would all love to hire a very expensive interior designer for a space in our home that we just don't know what to do with it. And that's exactly what I did. And I couldn't afford to get an interior designer, so I contacted Modsy, and I have them working on my space now. They're giving me great ideas. The thing I love the best is they're going to show me what to do with my space, what they can come up with, what they are capable of, and they're going to make suggestions. They're going to say, use this piece. You can find this beautiful piece from from this retailer and this designer and so on and so forth. And you can even get discounts on that furniture from Modsy. This month only, when our listeners go to modsy.com to start a design project and use promo code TCG, you'll get 20% off. That's 20% off for our listeners at modsy.com code TCG. That's M-O-D-S-Y dot com. Use our promo code TCG.
HelloFresh makes cooking delicious meals at home a reality, regardless your comfort in the kitchen. From step-by-step recipes to pre-measured ingredients, HelloFresh gives you everything you need to get a wow-worthy dinner on the table in just 30 minutes. So you can finally say goodbye to the endless grocery store trips and take out food. HelloFresh offers something for everyone, from family recipes to calorie smart and vegetarian and fun menu series like Hall of Fame and Kraft Burgers. Yum, yum, yum. And it's so flexible. Easily change your delivery days, food preferences, and skip a week whenever you need or add extra meals to your weekly order, as well as some yummy add-ons like garlic bread and cookie dough. The captain and I have been subscribers of HelloFresh for years now, and actually I will be making some HelloFresh good food tonight, making a little figgy balsamic pork with roasted green beans and rosemary potatoes. Yeah, and if you haven't tried the Kraft Burgers yet, you need to. They are amazing. For $80 off your first month of HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com slash Garage80 and enter promo code Garage80. That's like receiving eight meals for free when you go to HelloFresh.com slash Garage80 and enter our promo code Garage80. That's HelloFresh.com slash Garage80. Mod Cloth designs vintage-inspired pieces made relevant for the right now. Inspired by all things 70s, Falls Free Spirits call for crushed velvet, moody floral prints, and all the throwback-inspired silhouettes that were trendy then and classic now. You can also practice your best resting witch face from now until October 31st with their spooky, chic Halloween looks. Mod Cloth's coats have the warm and fuzzy feelings handled, but they're also not afraid to make a statement because staying warm and looking cool don't always have to be mutually exclusive. Mod Cloth believes fashion should celebrate all women. That's why they include a size range from 00 to 28. Got a question about fit? Their team of mod stylists can hook you up with complimentary sizing and styling help. I visited their website. You're going to want to do so as well. It's modcloth.com. I see what it's all about, Captain. It's about fashion. It's about design. It's about being super chic. They got some really cool stuff on there. You'll want to check out modcloth.com. Yeah, and you're going to love their spooky, chic Halloween looks. Hurry, this offer is only valid for a limited time. Get 15% off your purchase of $100 or more, including all sale items. Go to modcloth.com and enter promo code GARAGE at checkout. Hurry to get an extra 50% off all sale items through the end of October at modcloth.com. That's M-O-D-C-L-O-T-H.com. Use our promo code GARAGE. All right. Cheers, mates. Cheers to you, Captain. So Stephen McDaniel is going to claim he is innocent of this. He's now being charged with murder. Right. Can you imagine we have his his grandfather who probably had the best of intentions by hiring an attorney for his grandson. He hired this attorney for his grandson when his grandson was charged with burglary. Mm -hmm. After hiring the attorney, you find out that, okay, he's now going to be charged with possession of child pornography and for murder. So this attorney is going to continue to represent Stephen. And as said, Stephen is going to claim that he is innocent of these charges. It takes quite some time for this thing to get to trial because as said, the police are going to continue to build a case against him. The prosecutor is going to continue to build a case against him. One thing that happens is we have a former roommate of Stevens who comes forward to law enforcement and he's got a story to tell law enforcement. Yeah. Once upon a time, there was a creepy man that liked to play flicky flicky. Well, I'll read from the court documents what you don't have to. I just told you the story statement was. So it says this individual shared a dorm room with McDaniel during the fall of 2007, while the two were students at Mercer 
pursuing their undergraduate degrees. Mm -hmm. The roommate related the following information regarding conversations he had with McDaniel during that time. He is a self-proclaimed psychopath. He proclaimed often that he has no conscience and was incapable of feeling emotion. He talked almost nightly about how he would go about the perfect murder. He would wear shoes that were too small. He would do something to make him appear bald so that people wouldn't point him out because of his big hair. He detailed different scenarios all of the time. In fact, I was scared sometimes. That said, Stephen liked and trusted me, and I knew that. That's why I felt safe enough to stay where I was. I couldn't pick my own lock in my room. I tried several times just to see if I could do it. Stephen could do it in under 10 seconds. He demonstrated it to me once just to show how easily he could get to me if he wanted, and then he grinned. When I responded that I was twice his size, he told me he would use chloroform so that it would not matter how big I was. What Stephen relishes is power. He'll tell you, you don't have to ask him. Everything he does is the result of a power play. He is an odd duckling who looks weak, but has one of the sharpest minds I've ever seen. Steven said if he killed someone, he'd do it in a way to establish dominance over them. He always said he wanted to feel the power of having someone's life in his hands. He said he wanted them to beg and then to take it. I'm not sure what he did here, but he once said if he did kill someone, he'd dismember them, soak them somehow, then scatter the parts through the woods so that no one would ever find them. He was convinced he was smarter than everyone else and often bragged that if he did murder someone, that he'd never get caught. Yeah, and now we're seeing this play out in real life. The doc, Yeah, the document goes on to say, when I heard the news about the murder in Macon and heard that Stephen was somehow involved, I watched the interviews he gave to the news media at the scene. While watching one particular interview, it struck me that Stephen's tone of voice, demeanor, and hand movements were not Stephen's normal mannerisms, but instead nearly mirrored dialogue which he gave during a theater performance when we were both undergraduates at Mercer University. I also recalled... When seeing this, he informed me that he had no interest in the theater, but wanted to test himself to see if he was believable when telling a story. Yeah, well, I told you it was bad acting. Right. But now we're seeing that it's probably practiced. Right. That he has schooled himself and educated himself in a way to... To fool some people. To fool some people, but, but probably to eventually carry out his... Sick, right, fantasy. His mur- yeah, his his murderous fantasy that he has. Now, look, this is this is where it gets a little tricky, though, because you have this individual, and we have some evidence against him, right? Yeah, and it's piling up, and but we all know some friends of ours that were maybe picked on in school, maybe bullied, that maybe are just a little strange. And instead of being nice and trying to get people to like them, they they push back by being weirder. Well, if I'm just even more weird, then then they're not disliking me. They're disliking this weird character that I'm presenting to them. So when you're looking at this case, this is at the point to me where you go, well, all signs are pointing to this guy's guilty. But... As we're researching, I said, let me hold back a little bit, you know, maybe, maybe some of this stuff was planted, but this is where it gets a little strange and it's the icing on the cake. Let's say they find a USB drive in his apartment. The cops believe that it was a USB drive from Lauren. It was hers that she, uh, it was a bunch of photos of her. Um, I actually don't believe it was Lauren's thumb drive. I think it was actually Stevens. And when he was going into her apartment to mess around with things that he went onto her computer and pulled off whatever pictures he could find. Mm -hmm. 
some of these pictures were posted online, but most of these were just private pictures on her own computer. What is weird is that they were able to do search histories. So as he was looking at violent porn, he would, uh, they, they were able to determine that he would watch these violent porn things and then go look at these pictures of her mm-hmm. and then go back to the porn and then go back to the pictures of her. Well, and a lot of this stuff is coming out at his trial. Right. You know, they, they've put together a case against Stephen. They carry it forward. One other thing that came out in court, uh, well, actually, we'll get to two, but first, this is from District Attorney Greg Winters. He read this in court out loud. This is a graphic and profane post in which McDaniel allegedly wrote about an encounter with an attractive acquaintance. It says um, here, okay, party hard by drinking alone in front of my computer. See my sexy neighbor classmate come home late. She has talked to me occasionally in the past, has wanted, and this is removed and replaced with a certain piece of my anatomy, for three years. Invite her up for a nightcap. Make her a special drink called a Mickey Finn. She is out cold. I finally lose my V card. Oh no. She OD'd and died. I barbecue her legs and arms to celebrate losing my V card, not into organ meat, but throw her torso out. Lose it on TV while the cops are discovering her remains. You mad virgins. After the DA read this, by the time he was finished reading this, Again, this is a online post right. that is believed to have been from McDaniel. And the reason why they think that it was from McDaniel was he would often use a moniker. And I think it was something like the Sons of Liberty or Son of Liberty, something like that. And that moniker was used with this post. And also a lot of what it's describing is his situation. You know, lose it on TV while the cops are discovering her remains. Uh, talks about having this sexy neighbor that lives next door to him. By the time that, that Greg Winters is done reading this, McDaniel's eyes are shut in court. Yeah. He, he doesn't, he's, it's, it's almost like he's trying to mentally get himself out of that room as this is being read. Well, I'm going to the other thing, the, the, the even more icing on the cake, or if you want to say the cherry on top. So, the authorities, they did find something else, and this was through a lot of um, computer forensic work. Yeah. I've seen it reported two different ways, that this was either on his, a, a com- f- they found this from a camera or that they found this on his computer. Well, you should know. Regardless of what it was, it had been de- deleted, and they needed, that's why they needed the forensics mm-hmm. to locate this. So they called in Crispy Colonel. Yeah. Well, (laughs) studied computer, what they found, and this is going to really, he's at trial now, but this is really going to break the whole damn thing wide open. It's basically video clips and I've watched some that have been released there. There's not really any audio for them. And, and even with the audio, you wouldn't understand what you, what, what we're looking at the video clips. You can find them online. You can see them for yourselves. They were obtained and released by the Macon Telegraph eventually. They say that these videos were taken by Stephen McDaniel the night he killed Lauren Giddings. The videos are of Lauren's apartment and were taken between the hours of 9.30 p.m. and 12.30 a.m. In court, they describe this as Stephen using a camera attached to a six-foot-long wooden stick standing beneath her second-floor apartment and videoing her and he they will go on to say once they release this information and show this video in court they're going to go on and say he spied on lauren for months prosecutors said that stephen mcdaniel had become obsessed with lauren his next door neighbor at barristers hall apartments across the street from mercer university law school where they had been classmates and that stephen became devastated because they were both graduating and they would never see each other again. Now, court documents state 
a possible motive as Lauren was beautiful and outgoing. Stephen was a loner, had no girlfriend. And because Lauren was nice to him, he became fixated on her. And at some point he believed she should die. And he went to great lengths to try to cover it up. The showing of the video of Stephen spying on Lauren peeking through the blinds into her apartment was going to be Stephen's undoing. And because of this, he now wants a plea deal. Mm -hmm. He's going to confess to murdering his fellow classmate and next door neighbor. A full confession was part of the deal. They were able to work out a deal. Unfortunately, her family was in court and had to hear the confession. Stephen's story was this. This is according to the, the Macon Telegraph. He said that at 4.30 a.m. on Sunday, he broke into, this is June 26, he broke into her apartment dressed all in black. He used the master key to get into the apartment. He stood there watching her sleep before he startled her awake. She saw him and said very calmly, get the fuck out. Stephen said he leaped across the bed onto her and grabbed her around the throat. They struggled and tumbled out of the bed to the floor. Her legs and lower body went under her bed, this preventing her from getting away or from kicking him. During the struggle, Lauren managed to rip the mask off of McDaniel's face. He said she recoiled in horror when she recognized him. She pleaded, Stephen, please stop. McDaniel clenched his hands around her throat for 15 minutes until she stopped moving and then dragged her into the bathroom and placed her in the bathtub. According to his confession, he then returned to his apartment next door and spent the entire day on his computer. Then in the evening, he returned with a hacksaw and cut up her body. Said, I removed her limbs and head wrapped them in several black trash bags separately and discarded them in the Mercer Law School dumpster. He said he put Lauren's torso into the apartment trash can on June 28th, two days before it was found. McDaniel has denied raping Lauren, he says in his writing, quote, she was wearing the pink running shorts when she died and I never removed them. They were found on her torso just as I had left them. In the days after the murder, McDaniel attended classes and even joined the search party. Lauren's father, Billy Giddings, told the Macon Telegraph that he believes only one third of McDaniel's account, saying, quote, he's had a long time to put it together. That's about as good as he could get it. And that's pretty horrible. He goes on to say, quote, we just don't want him in our thoughts anymore. I hope he lives a long life in the worst possible way. During the course of his confession, McDaniel attempted to justify his or the murder. Yeah. He described himself as a divided mind, unable to account for how he could have committed these horrible acts. And that at the same time, he was also able to carry on daily routines. He went on to say, quote, it's difficult for me to explain why I killed Lauren and attempted to conceal my deed the way I did. I know that it was very wrong. I'm not delusional or without all morals or decency. Something in my makeup, my psychology, my neuropathy, my own particular pathology, perhaps, must explain it. He expressed remorse regarding, according to the newspaper, saying he grieves Giddings daily, but doesn't expect forgiveness from her family. He said, if I could take it back, I would. So since he is pleading guilty and confessing, then what is his sentencing? Well, he ends up getting life with the possibility of parole. Um, he is eligible for to request parole in 2041, but District Attorney David Cook said, quote, I fully expect Stephen McDaniel will spend the rest of his life behind bars. Now, just a little over a year ago, Captain, there was a habeas corpus proceeding. This was not whether McDaniel murdered or dismembered Miss Giddings. This was asking the judge if McDaniel's rights were violated, whether his guilty plea was voluntary, and whether his lawyers, according to this article, a pair of the brightest criminal defense minds in the region, if they somehow failed him. 
one thing that that was pointed out during this whole situation, and I think it's very funny, but it's very accurate. Many people have stated this was a chance for Stephen McDaniel to step into a courtroom and play lawyer. McDaniel claims in part that searches of his apartment were improper and that he was despondent, catatonic even, and in no state to allow searches or provide statements to law enforcement. Many have said that his appeal efforts afford McDaniel something he truly craves, which is attention and the spotlight. But the truly magical moment during this whole court proceeding thing here, Captain, came late in the trial when McDaniel put his defense attorney, his one-time defense attorney, Floyd Buford, on the stand. Yeah. McDaniel asked Buford if he recalled his demeanor in their first visit at the county jail, and Buford simply replies, weird. Uh, Stephen tried to call into question Buford's representation of him. Buford said McDaniel tried to help in his own defense, but McDaniel's efforts, quote, were from a law student's perspective. As the article puts it, then Buford took off the gloves, saying, now keep in mind, he is addressing Stephen McDaniel, who put him on the stand and is questioning him. Buford says, quote, you've never been in a courtroom in your life. We called the shots, not you. You started off facing the death penalty. You ended up receiving a life sentence with the possibility of parole. You didn't want to go to trial. You wanted to plead guilty. Buford revealed that after being confronted with the finding of the video showing McDaniel spying on Lauren on the night that she was murdered, McDaniel broke down and confessed the killing to his attorneys. Right. Buford, with the judge's blessing, recalled the moment from the stand, how McDaniel described the murder in full, saying, quote, up until the last couple of weeks of your case, I was strongly in your corner, believing you were innocent. I felt you were innocent, but this evidence that came in, that was very important. Buford went on to tell the graphic and detailed jailhouse confession that McDaniel gave to him and co-counsel Franklin Hugh about how you killed Lauren Giddings and how you went about decapitating her or carving up her body, how you even sat down and cut off every finger and bone and appendage on her hands and then threw them all in the toilet and flushed it all at one time. Buford said that coupled with the information authorities discovered on McDaniel's computer, including what he says is quote, the most horrific child pornography as well as internet searches for sex with dead people. All of this prompted what was very much in McDaniel's best interest requesting and taking a plea deal. That the, the whole appeal thing does not make McDaniel look any better. It does not clean anything up for him. In fact, McDaniel went on to lose this appeal. And it's, it's awful. Cause here's this monster of a person living almost this hermit life, having these fantasies and people not seeing the warning signs mm -hmm. or, or seeing some warning signs, but not, not, speaking up about them and then you have on the other hand lauren which is a, a beautiful person a smart person very driven was actually nice to steven this guy that a lot of people found odd mm -hmm. and and for him to want to sit there and, and try to play the system and at the end of the day her family um they were never able to find um, other parts of her, her of her remains mm -hmm. to have a, a proper, you know, a proper burial. Yeah, I don't know what he was hoping to achieve with this appeal, but I, I think what well, these people suspect is probably accurate. He's what he's hoping to achieve is is attention and to put himself in the spotlight. Right, but he and, also thinks he's smarter than everybody. So you know, he sits there and brags. Years before, if I do this, I won't get caught and I'll do this. Well, the, the thing is, you try to live out your fantasy and and you got caught. Well, and that's why I, I went through Buford's quotes 
of things that he said to Stephen while he was forced to be on the stand because Stephen called him to the stand. And I loved hearing his former defense attorney really just call the shots and say, look, man, you, you what what are you appealing here? We did everything for you. We did things that were in your best interest, whether you understood them at the time or not. It doesn't matter. Right. This is a, he's he's kind of it's a it's a very lengthy and um, roundabout way of telling Stephen, you're not the you're not smarter than me. You're not smarter than the court. You're you're not the smartest guy in the room. You're well, right. In fact, and, you're very dumb and you in a very dumb situation. And what happened, right. And what happened was they caught the, they caught this evidence. Like I said, it was the, the cherry on, on, on the top of the pile of, of a mountain of evidence. And when that happened and you realized when you had to realize yourself, Stephen had to realize himself, I'm not that smart. I'm not all these things that I thought I was, you know, whether you say there's two sides of you, even the evil side of you realized you ain't that smart. And, and then that's when you confess to your lawyers. So, you know, and it, well, and he's 100% a complete psychopath and 100% piece of shit. And unfortunately, Lauren Giddings lived next door to him, was his neighbor and was nice to him. And, it's just really, truly a sad, sad story. In the past, there have been walks, there have been softball tournaments. Uh, all of these events are in Lauren's name and in her memory. There is a scholarship fund set up in Lauren's name as well. And the third annual Lauren Giddings 5K walk is Saturday, October 19th from 8.30 a.m. to 12.30 at Central City Park in Macon, Georgia. You can go to truecrimegarage.com and check out our recommended page. We have all kinds of recommendations there for you. This week, a little recommended reading. We are recommending Hello, Charlie, Letters from a Serial Killer by Charlie Hess. You'll want to check that out. And while you're at our website, make sure you check out the store page as well. Thanks, everybody, for listening this week. Join us back here in the garage next week. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Don't litter.